we had a couple of little guys come in who had ingested it, which is pretty normal for kids to actually swallow things. What happened though is that they were, they, they were ingested, um, the, the actual chemical um, metabolised to a product called GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate. On the dance scene, it's known as fantasy or G. And so we had um, one fatality and we had a couple of really high kids which we were able to um, detoxify and get that chemical out. In that case, we were able to get it off the market, but we did have a fatality. We had a little boy who died from that. The manufacturers then took it away, reformulated it, and it's now back on the market called Beedos. Um, in that case, there was a very clear cause and effect. In that case, the manufacturer still didn't say it caused harm, but they're able to say, we might just take some precaution and change it, for example. So that's why it's really difficult to actually get chemicals actually off the market and why they're actually showing up in our newborn babies today, unfortunately. We also know that half of, new, of chemicals produced for, consume, uh, uh, um, for human consumption have never been tested for toxicity in the human body. Does that surprise you? It's full on, isn't it? Because you don't, there's some part of even me that goes, that can't possibly be happening. And when you look at the law, you look at how we produce chemicals, um, we look at how we release them you know, into the environment. Half of them have never been tested on the body and it's really proceed until danger is proven, unfortunately. The other thing about it is that when they are tested, and toxicologists are amazing, but when they are tested, we test for a single chemical as opposed to multiple chemicals. There is some changes going on in the toxicology field, but it's very hard because there are so many variables. What shampoo I use and you know, makeup, you know, what I wash with is very different from what you do. There is just millions and millions of variables and we can't test for them all. So even when they are tested, they're tested on a single chemical, unfortunately. Um, and yet, you know, and they don't, like, we can't test for short and term and long term effects. We, we don't do that kind of biomonitoring yet in Australia. And how we make chemicals is particularly interesting. We don't operate on a precautionary principle, we don't even operate currently on a green chemistry. So most of the time, chemicals are actually produced without thought for what kind of an impact will this have on the environment, what kind of an impact will this have on human bodies let alone children's bodies. We, we don't ask chemists, we don't ask those sort of questions yet, unfortunately. It's getting there. So what we're seeing is rises in everything. We're seeing more asthma than any other time in history. I mean, when I speak to my grandma, she was kind of like, well, we didn't even know what asthma was. You know, there were some kids in some communities that had respiratory issues, but not to the degree which we're actually seeing today. Autism, one in 150. It's, it's more in the United States. Um, that's those multiple causes. You know, that's that really difficult thing between trying to convince a government that there are increases in chemicals, increases in respiratory, increases in autism and the autistic spectrum, for example. Diabetes type 2, which is purely diet related. When I was working in the States even a couple of months ago, huge, huge in the States and were not that, behind, that far behind in, in, in Australia, you know, really. Developmental and reproductive disorders. One in six couples don't diagnose as infertile. Incredible. This has an implication on the reproduction of the planet, and yet we're doing very little about it. What we are doing is increasing technology such as IVF. You know, instead of looking at what we can actually take away from the environment to actually allow couples to actually get pregnant naturally. Sperm count decreasing in terms of quantity and quality um, by 1%. Hyperspadius, I mentioned that before, and that's a really interesting one because I've been doing quite a bit of work on that. Hyperspadius is that the opening of the penis is actually occurring not at the end of the penis, but actually down the penis, which has a significant impact on the reproduction, or will impact on our children, and particularly our boy children, but also on future abilities to actually reproduce as well. That used to, as I said before, be in like one in thousands, and these days it's around one in 300. Um, and that's directly linked to a lot of the plastics, the phthalates and the BPAs and the plastics we're seeing today in low doses. Also things such as un, um, um, testes that haven't dropped, for example, we're seeing more of those, for example, which actually has implications for reproduction and so forth. Cancer is just kind of out of control, really. Obesity. We've still, we've got the second highest rate in the world around obesity. You know, probably not in this room, <laughs> but certainly when you're actually out and about in terms of the amount of and of crap food we're actually you know, consuming, plus also the amount of chemicals we're actually consuming in there. Childhood obesity in Australia is rising at an annual rate of 1%, a trend which suggests that half of all young Australians will be overweight by the year 2025. Significant. 
absolutely huge. I love this quote by Schlozer. As a population, we eat more processed, preservative and additive packed, low nutrient foods and, and drinks in his, than any other time in history and more food in general. It sort of sums it up really, doesn't it? I get asked by the media to, to, uh, quite a bit and they ask me, you know, what, what's your diet plan? If you could put in, in place a diet plan, what would it be? And I always just say, eat as close to nature as possible and not really that much. You know, I mean, it's as simple as that and yet we're constantly kind of looking for these diets and fads or whatever. You know, and there are some really critical stages in our lives where we probably have to have more than others, but really, you know, that's kind of as, as close as we can get, I think, to it. In terms of what do we need for optimal health, in terms of what do we need for eco-parenting, there's quite a few and I haven't really put it in any order, but this is just to kind of wrap up what we actually need to do in terms of taking really critical steps. I think it's these ones. Deliberate birthing. Oh, two came up for one. That's my computer skills for you. Deliberate birthing is a really critical one. You know, most of the time, most of the women I speak to in the hospitals or even in parenting groups or mums groups say, I'm going to get to the hospital and see how it goes. You know what? We can tell you how it's going to go. You know, most of the time, unless it's a very straightforward, very quick birth, you're going to have medical interventions and seizure rates are very high. You actually, you know, most of the time, unfortunately, when someone says to me, I'm just going to see how it goes, if you haven't done any preparation, we do actually know how it's going to go. Interventions and seizures most of the time, unless it's very straightforward and unless you can actually get that baby out within the first five hours, six hours. Other than that, there's massive amounts of medical intervention. So deliberate birthing, being very clear about how you know, what kind of preparation do I need to bring in? What kind of support do I need to bring into my life? What kind of, um, where do I want to bring my, my baby into this world? That spiritual connection between you and your baby, something very magical is happening. And we're kind of medicalizing it in terms of, you know, maintaining that beautiful kind of magical um, space. So deliberate birthing is absolutely critical. Preconception care. Oh my God, I hope one, the one thing that you can get around this talk is, is thinking about, particularly mamas, I need to do massive preconception care, I need to detox, I need to really think about the foods going into my body, what kind of medication, if any, etc. before we actually bring our baby into this world. Not just for mums, but for dads. We need healthy sperm. Um, and preconception care is something we do not do very well in Australia at all, unfortunately. Conscious parenting, I'm going to go through that a little bit later, but what that actually means. Connection with na nature. I used to do a lot of these talks, and I always kind of, I always thought that there was something missing around this, and particularly as you grow children, connection to nature, the more connected we are with nature, the more it has an impact on how we bring our babies into the world, um, how we parent, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more a bit later. Preventative health legislation, I'm going to talk about that as well. And managing chemical exposures, all very critical. I love this quote, if the environment is contaminated, and the environment I mean, not just the environment out here, but if the environment in here, if we've got a very toxic environment, if it's contaminated, so too is the ecosystem of the mother's body. If a mother's body is contaminated, so too is the child within. And unfortunately, even within the green movement today, we talk a lot about what's going on out there without kind of going, well, the direct link between us and our ecosystem inside our body. Um, and, and particularly things like chemicals in Australia, to get that on the agenda of even the green movement is so difficult. So just that link between what's going on out there in the environment, what's going on in here is absolutely critical. It's also necessary to create a conscious, healthy, happy environment. You have to create it and you have to constantly create it and constantly, and particularly when you've got little dudes that are running around your house and you feel like you're going crazy, constantly creating is absolutely critical. Human exposure studies show that most of the exposures to pollutants occurs indoors from products we choose to use. Isn't that interesting? You know, in lots of ways it makes me go, wow, I can actually have a real impact on what's in my kitchen, what's in my fridge, what's in my, my cupboard in terms of personal care products. It gives us a lot of control and power. Yes, there's some stuff we can't control, there's some stuff we can control, and this is one of those things that we can very much control. And that just doesn't occur in our house, that's it in schools in our workplaces, we can have a really big impact on that and all studies show that it's actually happening indoors and we can actually have a really big impact on that. Conscious consumerism.